Hey folks, Steve here with the start of a new playthrough series covering The Deadly Woods, The Battle of the Bulge, designed by Ted Racer and published by Revolution Games. Uh, this is the introductory video where I sort of kind of talk through the basics um, and we'll look to do the setup as well, or at least talk through the setup uh, before future videos will take us through my turn-by-turn uh, -turn playthrough, and at the end we'll look at doing a review. Now for me, um, coming off of the last game that I covered uh, in depth like that, uh, that was a bit non-traditional in some of its mechanics, this is like settling into a worn-in uh, beloved couch. I am familiar with this game series, so this is technically part of the Dark series. I mean, you can get into a whole branding conversation, um, of is it, is it the same series or not, and, and technically it is. The Dark and Deadly series are what started with the Dark Valley, uh, then came the Dark Sands, this is the Deadly Woods, and then uh, there are other games coming down the way. Uh, GMT is going to publish the Dark Summer, and I consider Case Yellow 1940 to be sort of an unofficial member of the series as well, but that's a whole other thing. Um, so I've covered uh, the Dark Sands, and the Dark Valley in detail. In fact, I think my most watched videos are the Dark Valley series that I did uh, a year ago or over a year ago, a couple of years ago now, I think almost. It's crazy how time flies. Um, so I am pretty well versed in the game series in terms of what it offers, and I really appreciate the solitaire capability of the game series. It is chit pool, which means that uh, in any given turn, you're gonna have a series of actions driven by the chits that are pulled from a cup. And that's going to govern who goes and what they can do, uh, which means as a solitaire player, which for a while I've been nothing but a solitaire player for the most part, uh, that works out really great. You have the ability to simply say, okay, here's the chit that is up. We're going to play it to the best of our ability, and then we'll pull the next chit and just play all the way through there. So good stuff uh, to expect. Now, um, I've got myself set up here on my primary tables for gaming. What's funny is, you know, I was going from a kind of a monster three mapper game closer to a monster two. Uh, it's something much more simpler here. So if I sort of take the camera back for a second, you can see uh, we are really a one mapper game. I've got the setup map here, which I'll explain shortly. I have some of the player aid sheets and a few custom uh, helpers that I printed off from Board Game Geek uh, next to the map. Over here, some more player aid charts uh, and a copy of the uh, action shed availability chart that I printed out for myself just, just to have all the tools at my disposal as much as I would like to have them uh, on the way through. So I've got plenty of space to work with here. Easy, easy peasy. Uh, but really, we're just going to be looking at the main map here and uh, over sort of hidden underneath the setup map. Uh, you can see over here there's various uh, tracks for the turn and the action round stuff. I've got all the uh, counters uh, clipped, uh, well, punch, clipped, and organized. So you can see, um, see some of the units here. They look nice, all clipped and good to go. Um, I have to say I was very happy with the counter quality as I punched the counters. They came out of the counter sheet very easily, uh, very cleanly. Uh, you know, you still have the nibs like any counter would. But my, uh, I did brown the corners with my uh, my tool, and, and it worked really well and easy, and they clipped easy, and I managed to work my way through clipping these um, pretty quick, uh, pr quick order. And the game's really just a sheet and a half of counters, so it comes out pretty quickly. And I have all the baggies sort of organized by administrative counters, uh, units that start the game on the map, and then organize the other smaller baggies of units by their reinforcement, uh, their reinforcement uh, order, I guess, is the way to look at it. Or all units coming in on certain turns are all grouped together. So setup should be pretty easy with the aid of this setup map. And so the way that this works is, you know, you can set, I guess I should make this easier for myself and move the box. Um, quick word on the box. I really like the box. I just think it looks cool. Uh, that really matters for anything, but there you go. Um, so uh, here you can have the setup map, uh, and it is really copying the same map information from here to here. And what you can do is you can look and say, okay, all the units that are marked 
with uh, the number one, the green number one means any US unit or you know allied unit with a number one in the top left corner of the counter will go into uh, hex 3823, which is right there and you, you or I'm sorry, right here, and you plug that in and you just add them to uh, to the chart. So just the, the setup chart helps you look at uh, the map a little more quickly. It's kind of a, it's a nice support option. It is a little odd to see, but I, I will see how much it helps the setup. It might help quite a lot, but you're sort of forced to using it because the units don't have a hex number on them like you might see in uh, the Dark Valley or the Dark Sands or something. It is the number code, and you have to look at the setup chart to see what uh, number code does that equate to, and then you can set them up uh, along the front line. So um, you, you'll get it eventually. <laughs> um, shouldn't, shouldn't be too bad, uh, so I'll set this to the side for the moment. Uh, you can see uh, we have a very wintry map. Uh, looks pretty nice. It is a paper map. I have uh, one of my sheets of Plexi on top, so we'll be using Plexi for that. So there is a chance there'll be some glare, depending on the angle. I'll try to minimize that for you guys as we go. Um, and you can see some of the important locations. There's Best Stone. Uh, here's St. Vith. I'm, I'm sure I'm going to butcher some of these French names. You're just going to have to live with that a little bit. Um, and uh, you have Liege way up here. Uh, Namur way out here. So there's a couple different you know, important locations for the campaign. Uh, and you have critically important, uh, some of these cities have, or towns, what, whatever you want to call them, um, well, I guess they're cities and towns, uh, it could be the case, have a red outline in the hex. That means they are a victory point uh, location, and the Germans are going to want to basically get as many of those as they can. If they get five victory points, I believe that is a victory condition uh, to win outright, and then depending on what turn it is or the end of the campaign, they need to have a certain number of them to win and so we'll sort of see <clears throat> how well that works across the 12 turns. Uh, there are 12 turns so it's not a super duper long game. Um, I think by all accounting this is probably the well so released so far. The Dark Summer may influence this once it's released. I think this is probably the smallest in the series uh, in terms of footprint. So um, again if you consider Case Yellow a member of the series then maybe it's more difficult to make that statement. But it's just 12 turns, and it is a single mapper as opposed to, say, the Dark Sands, which I think, I, I, I'm trying to remember, is it 17 turns or 21 turns? I, I can't remember off the top of my head. But in that game, you had the multiple maps that all stretched out lengthwise, so it was kind of a big map any which way you looked at it. Uh, the Dark Valley is a two mapper with a ton of counters. The counters are smaller, the hexes are smaller. So really, this is... Um, uh, it should be a much smaller game. Should play a lot faster is my expectation. Um, it, what's really interesting to me is that you have the Dark Sands, you have the Dark Summer, you have this game um, that are all more zoomed in for an operational game. And then you have the Odd Man Out, which is the first game in the series, the Dark Valley, which shows the entire East Front of World War II uh, from, you know, 41 to 45 and... Uh, dealing with monthly turns and the whole thing. And it's just a totally different scale of operation here. But we should be able to see the game play out. I can probably leave the camera at this angle for the majority of it, and you'll see most of the action, and we'll zoom in at certain important points along the way. Um, there are uh, some handy-dandy sheets that will help us understand what the counters are. You will have armor units, mechanized units, infantry units, um, I believe one tricky bit here is that some German units, or several, many German units, have three steps. So they have a counter, they have a reduced side on the back, and then you have a third step, which is a wholly separate counter. And I'm going to need to find somewhere either on the map or somewhere around here to keep those guys. There, It doesn't look like there's a specific place on the map that was intended uh, to be dedicated to those extra units or those, you know, third step units. So I just have to pick a place and put them there. And if a unit becomes so reduced, I'll have to go find the matching counter. It'll have the same unit name on it or, or designation uh, for it. So there's a lot of specifics we'll get into as we go. 
Um, I don't want to spend too much time just on all of that uh, as we play through. I have read through the rules. It's 24, rule, 24 pages of rules. Uh, pretty straightforward. It is very similar to the Dark Sands uh, and, and uh, the other games in the series, so I kind of knew what I was getting into uh, in terms of how retreats work and the combat results table, uh, the use of assets, so there are a number of counters that sort of abstract uh, different things. Some of it could even be controversial because it's sort of like the allies can play a traffic marker, which historically there were traffic problems for the Germans of where they were sending units along roads and it got congested. Um, and rather than that be random or sort of happenstance, the allied player can place uh, an asset chit somewhere on a road and that will increase the movement cost of that location due to traffic. It might be a little weird from a simulation standpoint to say, well, the allies didn't get to pick where that happened, but that's just a game element, I guess. So you know, that's something to live with. But you have some assets that are like that. You have other assets that are like artillery units uh, that can be used in particular combats, organized around the uh, division and core structure of how the armies are organized. So there's all, some uh, elements of that and certain command restrictions that exist. The Germans have to operate with different army configurations. So there's the 6th Army, that operating area is sort of in the north up here. You have the 5th uh, Panzer Army, which is the sort of center. Uh, and then I think it's the, I want to say it's the 7th, that is down here. Um, so there are some restrictions on how units can operate for several turns. That restriction goes away after a while. So there are a lot of different things locked up in it, but the rules themselves are pretty straightforward. There's nothing terribly complicated um, that I found in the rules. The only tricky part, um, and this could be maybe one nitpick out of the gate, is that there are a number of exceptions and special rules in the game. Um, more so, it, they stick out a lot more than other games where, yeah, the Dark Sands had some exceptions and special rules. The Dark Valley had plenty of special rules that the player aids helped with. In this game, there actually is a decent number of special cases and rules that you have to keep in mind. Many of these affect the first few turns. Some of them stretch into turns 4, 5, and 6, and even a handful into the later turns. Um, somebody did put a guide on Board Game Geek already, a file that kind of breaks down the special rules. Um, I need to reformat that document because it it's on three pages. I could probably get it scrunched down to two, like a, a front side and a back side piece of paper. Um, but the PDF that's available, you can't do text selection. At least I couldn't. So there's some weird stuff out there that folks are trying to make easier for play that might have been nice to include straight up in the game box. But um, the, the game seems to be supported well by the publisher and, and, and Ted seems to be... Uh, active in supporting the game. So you really shouldn't run into too many issues with that. The uh, challenge will be on me to remember these special rules to get that extra sheet printed off to help me keep track so that I don't screw up. That, that's the thing I'm most afraid of is as I play through this, I screw up and you guys don't see the game the way it's meant to be played. So I'll try to take it slow and work my way through it. The game is set up as a 12 turn full campaign. Uh, you can play a six-turn shorter campaign, which has the, just the Germans on offense through the mid part of the game. <clears throat> we'll play through a full campaign for the full experience and, and get the most as we can out of the game. Um, as I'm just watching the, the, the camera feed as I'm recording, I just got to say, I really like the map. I just find it very aesthetically pleasing. I really like it. Um, and though there's a lot of shades of like brown, green, and white, uh, the distinct terrain types stick out very well. So you have, obviously, clear. Uh, you'll have light woods, which is the little spotty woodlands. Then you have regular woods, which is sort of the basic green color. And then you have denser forest, which is this sort of darker green color. And then you have rough, which is sort of the brown raised terrain. Um, and it... And it and that's really the majority of the terrain types that you have to differentiate, and they all stick out pretty well, I think. I'm not, I don't think there'll be any point where I'll be confused on the terrain type, or I don't expect to be. So this is all, it looks very attractive. It's got a, the wintry look uh, that's evocative uh, of the, of the uh, campaign. 
Um, it's just really nice looking. The counters are all very nice. I mean, I'm just very impressed with the production value overall of the game so far. The rule book is not uh, a color rule book, but it makes up for that in the player aid sheets that are colorful and helpful. Um, and as a post-published document, they did put out an extended example of play. Uh, that is in PDF form, digital form only, but I found that it worked well to read that and to check it out, so I recommend folks take a look at that. Just, you know, publishing that as a post-publication document rather than, you know, including it in the rules of play, I could see where they were able to reduce some of the production costs, which is nice for them and, and is fine. I mean, I, I read it on my phone, you know, in my free time in the house, you know, whatever, um, you know, managing to read a few pages of that at a, at a time and getting a sense for the game besides what I could already project being familiar with the series. So um, I think that's enough basic intro. Uh, if you've seen the other games in the series, you're going to know what you're, you're getting into. Uh, you can see there's a, a uh, I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see it better. There is an action shit summary. So that comes with the game and tells you what all the different action shits actually do. There's a little bit of errata I wrote on my player aid sheet there. Um, there's a sheet of errata that has been published. It's all relatively minor errata, nothing too crazy. Um, all very easily marked in your rule book with pen or on the player aid sheet and pen. Uh, very minimal. I mean, it takes like a minute to go correct those. So not a big deal from an errata perspective. There is a little bit, but not a big deal. Um, okay, so I am going to off camera uh, begin to do setup. If there's anything really important as I do that to bring up, I'll do that. But uh, we'll come back to the recording for you. It'll just be a split second with the game set up and we'll be able to see kind of the game situation uh, at start here. Okay, so I've completed the German setup and it was actually quite easy. So uh, because I had organized the counters into uh, a bag for all the ones that begin at setup because they have a simple number in the top left, I took them out of the baggie and I, per the rule book's recommendation, I numbered them one to 30. So a pile, you know, one, two, uh, three, four, five, six, all the way through 90. Some of those spots were multiple units. So you just stack them up. Uh, like for instance, 13 has two units. So it's made a line of units uh, across uh, my table. And then I referenced the setup map and said, okay, here's number one. I put the unit marked one here. Uh, same thing then two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And it was very simple to just line them up and it worked really easy. Uh, the setup map was convenient for that purpose. So that was pretty cool. Now uh, there are a number of units that uh, are really their asset markers that start uh, in the asset box and they are in the they have the box in the top left so you can see that's not a setup code that is a square that indicates that this artillery marker starts in the asset box so there are three artillery markers three rocket artillery markers and then uh, a motorized infantry marker and i think one of the optional chits i'm gonna have to double check that um, so all of that is set up over here uh, very easy to do that, I have the action chits, the rest of the administrative markers I've set up. Uh, so these are some of the uh, extra uh, asset chits, or action chits rather, that aren't being used. Uh, there are a number of other administrative uh, actions that I wanted to have set up. So we have the uh, victory marker, uh, victory point total marker, markers representing the bridge repair box for the Germans. There is a action chit that starts in the hand of the allied player. So it's just used by at their discretion. So I just put it here for now until I can find a better place to put it. Um, the rule book on turn one uh, describes a particular order of actions that must happen in a certain order. And those action chits or the markers for that I've set up here on the action round track. I've actually copied this thinking a little bit from the Vassal module, which is available from the Revolution Games website, uh, where they have it set up this way, where the Germans will have combat, then they'll get to move, the Allies will get to react, the Germans will use a paratrooper unit to do something, and then the Allies will place a, uh, a marker that will hurt the German traffic situation. Um, and I think that is, I'll, you know, we'll, we'll go through that in more detail in the next video when I start the game, but there you go. Uh, I have all of the third step units just piled up here, so if something actually loses its second step, 
I'll have to sift through that bunch of counters and figure out what the what unit is going to come on the board or figure out what's going on there. They do not have a setup code. Uh, they just several of them have a a, a, a eleven uh, in black in the top right of the counter. Let's see if I can get that to focus. Uh, it's just I'm going to be fighting with it to do so. There we go. Uh, that 11 in a black circle, that denotes that this is a, a unit uh, that is worth counting on turn 11 to determine if units are going to be uh, withdrawn and this impacts victory conditions. We'll talk about that a little later uh, or in another video. I won't cover, won't spend the time here in this video to talk through that. I have the turn marker on turn one. I have all of the uh, reinforcements uh, on their boxes. So basically each turn you're going to have a reinforcement action chip and if it's the first one drawn then you're going to get the unit in the second or i'm sorry in the first column next to the turn track and then when you pull your second chip you'll get the next batch of reinforcements you'll you'll get different waves of reinforcements and so i have them set up thusly uh and i still have the allies obviously in their baggies i haven't set them up but i just wanted to show you guys uh the, the progress so far very quickly so you can see what's going on and then I do have some of the other uh, administrative counters in little soy sauce dishes as I use for organization. So control markers, um, bridge destroyed, and supply markers, and a few other oddball ones I have to go look up <laughs> what the marker is supposed to be for. Um, I th oh, these are the su oh, these are the supply action shits. I'm such a silly guy. Okay, resolve. So I really only need two source sauce dishes. There you go, guys. Now I can use this for soy sauce. Uh, okay, so uh, that's the German setup, and now I'll go through and take care of the Allied setup, and we'll take a look at what the map looks like at uh, at that point. Okay, so here we are after the Allied setup. Um, the uh, the U.S. or the Allied player gets a lot of. Uh, it's a lot of reinforcements you can see all set up along here quite a number <laughs> compared to the german reinforcements which gives you you know the clue in obviously to the long-term uh sustainability of the german offensive which will grind to a halt halfway through the game very likely um and then the actual setup here a few things worth pointing out and i can get zoomed in when we go to play um, there are a few bridges that are that start the game destroyed. So there's one, two, uh, three that are set up this way. I'm sorry, four. Can't forget this guy. He's underneath a, uh, a U.S. unit. So really the principal crossing bridges um, towards the, uh, the west wall uh, have been blown. So, you know, down here, not really worth trying to cross. Uh, Likewise here, boom, boom, and then everything else. There are bridges that are along this way that are intact, um, but these specifically have been uh, destroyed or blown. You can repair those. There's a process to do it. Some of it's just related to uh, a limited number of repairs that can occur for the Germans, and then uh, I believe the Allied player can make use of engineer assets to help do that. Um, you have to double check the rules, but it's not terribly complicated. But terrain becomes a pretty important factor here. So the roads, the critical uh, road crossings, which is why uh, Bastogne will be so important in time uh, because it connects all those railways in addition to being a victory point hex. Um, and really, you can see there's a bit of a thin allied line at the start. So just a handful of units over here. A little bit of a screen out this way, some units, some units here, a little bit along here. Um, but there are there's the potential, obviously, to mess these guys up. Now, uh, there are a number of special rules that are going to govern certain sectors here that really incentivize a German player to act a certain way. There's a fuel depot here, so if we can get uh, particular units into uh, Bullingen, that will get... Uh, this uh, fuel depot marker will apply. I've sort of placed it here as a reminder for now. Um, if we can get into uh, St. Vith by a particular turn, we'll get some conditional reinforcements as the Germans. 
if we can knock these two units out of supply, uh, or I guess this unit might be included as well, the 106th division, um, then they can be uh, knocked, uh, knocked out. Uh, they, will be, they will surrender. Um, I think maybe that has to do with these guys were something happened historically here with these guys where um, they were not as hardy and surrendered under those circumstances. So it that's a special rule to govern that. So we knock these guys out of supply. We don't have to destroy them. They will surrender at the end of turn two. Turn two might be a while. Uh, we'll just have to see how this goes. And then um, let me see if there's anything else important to note. Um, I think really that's it before we get started in the game proper. Um, so let's take a quick review of some of the additional play aids that I'm using. So we have the base game charts that have a combat results table. They have the terrain effects chart. We have the action chart summary. We have the player aid one, which tells us what all the counters got. Uh, we have, uh, I had uh, downloaded this off board game geek. It's just a combat modifier summary. So in case I want to look, <laughs> I can look at the terrain effects chart or I can look at this. It's nice having information a couple different ways. Um, so you can see there's a, a different smattering of cases that give you shifts on the, uh, the odds. There's one die roll modifier under a certain circumstances and then uh, a few other special cases. Nothing too crazy, but just good to have. It's just one sheet. Nice summary in case I need to cross-reference something. And then uh, what I did do is I took the special rules reminders by turn on Board Game Geek and sort of rewrote it myself in Word uh, and turned it into a document. So I have here um, all of it for turn one, all in one column. And that looks like a lot. It's really not that bad. A lot of it's just basic stuff that is over pretty quickly. Uh, then there's some turn two stuff in the second column, and then on the back, I have turn three, turn four, turn five, turn six, seven, eight, nine, and eleven. Skipping ten, there's nothing special about ten. And you can see most of these special rules eventually just kind of peter out, and it's more like conditional stuff, like, hey, don't forget you can do this on this turn. You know, it's not a huge deal, but it's just good to have. And then for some of the, even turns two and three, a lot of it just comes down to, uh, you have a certain marker available to you. Don't forget about that marker that you have available for these turns and a couple other special cases. It's, it's not so bad. I mean, it looks like, oh man, here's two pages of special rules reminders. It's really not so bad. Um, and it doesn't feel terribly different than the special rules for turns in the Dark Valley, and maybe we had some of the Dark Sands, I'm trying to remember back. Um, it's not too bad, and most of these special rules are really just circumstantial, they're just reminders. So the way I typically approach this is, if I'm going to start a new turn, I can take a look at, at, at this, remind myself if there's anything special I need to keep in mind, and then play through the turn. Now that, this is, I think the Dark Sands have the same thing where or even the Dark Valley. I think originally the Dark Valley didn't have a special turn summary chart, and then the Deluxe Edition, they added it. I think the Dark Sands lacked one, and I, I think I might have created one, or someone did a few years ago, um, and that probably should have been in the game to begin with for the Dark Sands, and I kind of feel the same way here, like knowing there's so many of these special rules, they, they probably should have tried to make that a little bit easier on the player and just added that in. Like, you know, you have two different copies of this, maybe on the back side of one should have been a special turn reminder or even, honestly, here, here's the player aid one with, you know, it's one copy. You can see what all the counters mean. Well, on the back is this nice picture, which is cool. I like that. But this whole page should have been something of a special turn reminder. I realize I'm talking about a two-page document for myself, but they could have figured out a way to fit that in, maybe. So if there's any criticism so far, it's just, yeah, there's a fair number of special rules. Uh, it It's not so bad to have a reference for yourself, and, and I, you know, someone typed one up, and I made a slightly modified version of that for myself. 
Um, but, you know, that, that could have been solved with one extra player aid sheet, and then that would have helped a lot, which is why they included it in the deluxe edition of the Dark Valley from GMT, and hopefully if the Dark Sands gets reprinted, they'll come up with one for that. And maybe if this game gets future printings, they'll figure out a way to uh, include that in the game. Um, so I'm pretty much ready to rock and roll uh, when I'm, whenever I, I guess I feel like I'm gonna record next. Um, I do have the, uh, the chip pull cup that has some stuff in it that's really gonna be uh, waiting for the initial uh, required actions that, again, I mentioned before that we have to follow on turn one in a specific order. Um, so really, much like, I mean, very much like uh, the Dark Valley where Barbarossa has a lot of special stuff tied up in it, uh, the Dark Sands has a lot of special stuff, special stuff tied up in it, so too does this game where that first turn, as it replicates all the surprise and, and events of the opening phase of the campaign, you kind of have to work through that stuff. And I'm sure there's going to be somebody sitting there saying, well, that sounds awfully scripted, and, you know, is the game too scripted? I think that thought process, you know, chases the series. It chased the Dark Valley a bit. Um, I think folks playing the Dark Sands asked about that. I mean, I, I definitely think there is... The journey of the campaign is going to follow uh, in within a framework that isn't going to be totally off the rails. If you do very well, then you can go off the rails, right, and have an ahistorical victory for the Germans, at least by the way the game rates victory, um, or vice versa, or whatever. So you're not, you know, it, the game's not going to be decided for you. You obviously will still have the ability to, to make things different. Um, but some of what's baked in, uh, and, I, and I think I called this out when I played the Dark Sands, there is stuff that is outside your control. If you're just in charge of this operation, this campaign, there are strategic level things happening with the war that you don't have control over, and that factors into the action shit schedule in certain things that you, you just can't help, right? Like, you you know, you don't have as strong of air support uh, as you would have invading France in 1940. So... So there's just certain things like the game has to reflect those realities. You just don't get a get-out-of-jail-free card because it's a war game and you can just do whatever you want. There, you, know, you, you are still operating in this campaign with the historical constraints of the actors in the campaign, but you still have enough margin, I think, or this is my suspicion based on other games in the series, that you have enough margin to, to still have it be a game. You still have to make decisions. You have to play the situation as best as you can and hope for victory. Um, before I close up, I want to call up a couple of things for victory's sake. Um, I believe the way it works out is the Germans can get an automatic victory if they hold five victory point cities. And then throughout the game, they ideally need to be holding on to four or three or under certain circumstances, two victory point cities. The closest ones to the starting point of the game are going to be St. Vith, which I mentioned has some conditional reinforcement stuff. So this whole sector has some well-advised actions that the German player should probably try to do in the beginning phases of the game. Uh, the next one, uh, next ones out of that that you're likely going to be looking at are going to be Vestone. I can't pronounce that, but there's that one. Um, and then from there, it is really going to be dependent um, on how far you push, right? If you're actually able to take the stone and the allies haven't held on to it via air supply and other things, then you're looking more maybe down here. Or maybe you're looking for a marche. Um, I don't know what it would take to be operating way over here, but that's almost uh, a non-issue. I mean, I guess you would... I guess it's possible you might need that, you know, you might need that victory point if you made made a big southern cut and you didn't get St. Vith and you got Bastogne and New Chateau and Sedan, you know, maybe then these areas way over here become more important. But I think, you know, the core areas of success are probably going to be St. Vith, Bastogne, this place here. 
up north if you're getting to UPenn or close to Liege, that would be one thing. Um, I think looking at the historical campaign and you only got six turns, um, you know, you're, you got to make the play. And, and I guess there'll be a decision point, I suspect, as the German player. Do you, do you overextend yourself trying to get the five victory points? Uh, or do you do a little more conservatively, uh, you know, advance, but do so carefully so that you can make it through the last half of the game, holding on to three victory points and, and winning that way, um, or whatever the case may be. Because again, I mean, you look out to Namur, uh, there's several victory points over here. Um, but again, to, to, to have those victory point places even matter, you probably would have taken some of these other areas, so you're really going to be pushing up against that five. Anyway, if you're if you're getting across the Meuse in this game, the Germans are probably winning at that point, right? That was sort of the objective of the campaign anyway, right? Was to get over the Meuse and, and cut uh, some armies of the Allies uh, out of supply and, and get to the English uh, Channel and that kind of stuff, um, whatever you want to call it, get to Antwerp and, and cut off uh, allied forces. So, you know, wh whether or not this is even, uh, feasible or if it's a pipe dream, I guess we'll find out, but I suspect that will be a great challenge, um, depending on how well we perform. The huge string of allied reinforcements will probably make it that any huge gains we make are going to be at a lot of risk of being picked apart piecemeal by the resurgent, uh, allied forces. So, when you look at it from that perspective, um, uh, you know, maybe we're just getting ahead of ourselves. We've got to make turn one happen before we get too excited, right? Um, so we'll, we'll see how all of that works. Um, I'll probably need to take my time with this one. Just a heads up for you guys as I go to play. This means that the next videos will probably be very long. The first couple of turns tend to be longer ones because I'm going to really walk through every action um, I'll probably be stopping a lot, thinking, coming back, talking for a few minutes, just just like I usually do in my video series, where we're gonna we're gonna go really slow in detail through the several turns. Probably towards the end of the playthrough, things will pick up and we'll move a little bit faster because I think I will have demonstrated the game enough that really you guys just want to see what happens by the end, and uh, we'll we'll see how it works. So uh, there you go, guys. Introduction for the Deadly Woods uh, introduction and setup. We will look to do turn one in the next video when I can get to it, and uh, we'll work our way through it. I'm excited to uh, finally get to have this one on the table and to, uh, to play it out. I know you guys were, several of you at least, were very interested in seeing this uh, come out, so uh, we're in good shape. Um, so thanks for watching, guys. Uh, hit like if you like the video. If you want to see more, subscribe. And until next time, take care, guys. Keep gaming.